So, ladies and gentlemen, we stand having covered two of the three legs of the stool, the foundational concepts and category theory, categories and functors. We stand here together on the cusp of greatness um, because uh, we're going to be able to take on, in short order, the third and fundamentally enabling leg of the stool. We have before us a noble task, but it's it's um, it's a challenging one, and, and we need to to recognize that um, it'll test your metal um, uh, beyond um, what the previous two concepts um, um, has been involved in the previous two concepts, um, uh, and that's for several reasons. Um, uh, notationally, it can be a little uh, uh, natural transformations can be a bit opaque. Um, uh, in terms of the concepts, this builds on the other two in a very important way and requires a certain facility of thinking about the other two and kind of um, switching between them in ways that can be um, that can can test your your um, your grasp of those materials and. Um, and really expose, you know, confusions. Um, and, uh, and yet, natural transformations are a very natural concept um, if understood properly. The very name of them is a reference to the fact, not that, that we have, um, uh, you know, that we're uh, speaking about something um, that is natural in the sense that it's you know being discovered in the world um, uh, in a in a sense of you know minerals and geology or anything, but it's uh, it's natural in the sense that it it's it's in the nature of things. It fits. It's um, it's it's not um, it's principled um, uh, and uh, in natural transformations. Uh, have a certain intuition associated with them that whilst initially often elusive for students um, can make them seem second nature in many cases. Um, so not surprisingly, perhaps, for many of you, uh, if, if you think about our progression, we talked about categories and we, we of course, couldn't talk about categories without talking about connections between categories, because category theory is all about connections between things. And far from it, to, to, far, far from us to, to, to just focus on the pieces, we want to focus on connection between the pieces. Um, and there's some, some constructs I haven't dwelt on, but which are talked about by Spivak and Fong um, in some of the lectures, and maybe even by Bartosz's lectures, uh, Bartosz Mieluski, but um, that uh, where we conceptualize actually categories where each object is, is a category or a small category, category uh, uh, which, which has a finite set of objects associated with it. And... Um, uh, and the morphisms between those categories. Well, what do you think the morphisms between categories are? Anyone? What's a morphism between category? What's a mapping between categories that preserves structure? It's a what? Functor. So, so we have this category, cat, C-A-T, bolded as as is the convention when indicating a name of a category, um, and where the, the objects are small categories and the morphisms are functors, are, are these mapping, structure-preserving mappings between categories. Um, and, and that is a certain satisfaction to it that we could 
could, could capture that. But it begs the next question, which is, um, that's nice, but are there mappings between functors which are in some sense significant, in some sense structure preserving? And uh, the answer is yes. And um, overwhelmingly, the mapping of, of interest between functors are natural transformations. Natural transformation is in some sense a mapping between functors. And, you know, by going meta um, further, we could imagine a, a category where the objects are functors and the natural transformations are mapping between those functors. But then that brings up a, a question, doesn't it? Because in category theory, we're, we're really interesting not in any old random mappings, you know, um, that, that are just unprincipled and, and splay things down in, in some willy-nilly fashion. Um, we, we're interested in mappings that preserve structure, that stay true to the original structure um, uh, being mapped, um, and, uh, and thereby in some sense uh, embed the original structure at some level of resolution in the target. And so it brings up the question, well, okay, um, if you have functors and you have mappings between functors, so you have a function, functor f um, and, and another functor uh, g, what are, what are the mappings uh, here between them? And, and natural transformations um, will actually end up preserving, uh, end up having this structure preserving property. Now, I've glossed over some really important things, and, and this is one of the things which trips students up. Um, it, it turns out that um, the way they're defined is a little bit different from how I've described them in terms of being a mapping from f to g, um, functor f to, to f of g. Um, it's actually um, uh, something where we do have a mapping between them, but we often conceptualize it or think about it um, at a more basic level to understand it at first. And only later do we go to this level of, of the categorification of which, ladies and gentlemen, I just spoke. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, share my screen. And I'm not going to give... Um, it was not my plan, nor is it my intention, to give a complete exposition of natural transformations uh, here. I'm going to stand on the shoulders of giants, and I'm going to give you some videos in which they discuss natural transformations. Uh, most notably, a, a video by Bartosz Mielewski, which I, I consider very helpful in this regard, um, and very intuition-building. But... I, I want to warn you that um, that when it comes to natural transformations, you, like me, like everyone else I know, will find natural transformations initially a kind of slippery topic. Um, there's, there's kind of a lot to grasp there, and it will initially seem elusive. You won't have that intuition. You don't have that insight about what it really means and why, why we care about it so much. And so what I've done is to somewhat shamelessly borrow materials from others um, in a poor man's fashion, tried to supplement with some of them with my own, with diagrams that, um, uh, that are uh, unfortunately rendered mute um, on account of um, the uh, the sort of poor color capturing uh, on the uh, the images.
but basically try to bring out some structure of natural transformations because you can you can conceptualize them with different types of diagrams very usefully and i'm going to walk you through uh three or four different ways of conceptualizing them visually that i hope when you watch Bartosz's video and, and maybe one or two other videos I'll give you, you can kind of go back to this catalog of ways to think about them. And by taking these different stances with respect to material, you all have different perspectives that may bring it more quickly and lend you a sense of intuition. Okay, um, so I'm going to just share my, um, share my desktop here. Um, and uh, share indeed uh, my slides. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Um, great. So um, the foundational diagram here um, is one that Bartosz articulates in this video, which I consider wonderful, and its its link is is there. It's really a great video, and and uh, you know. I've splayed this diagram down to you, and I need to explicate it a little bit, okay? Um, so we have uh, category C on the left. We have category D on the right, okay? Um, two different categories. And um, what we're going to have is two different functors. I talked about natural transformations being mappings between functors. And lo and behold, there's two different functors here, F and G. Okay, um, so there's there's a functor F and a functor G, and both of them are going to be mappings from category C to category D. Okay, so they map from C to D. I mean, as functors, they map two sets of things. What what do functors map? Speak on, youths. What do fact functors map? They map two types of things: what to what, what, what to what, and what to what. Good man, good man. Um, uh, so, so a functor f can map objects to objects. So it maps a to f of a, and in Haskell notation, it's just written f a. Okay, uh, f applied to a. Um, the other functor will map a into g a. Hmm? So same object in C. Both functors map from C to D. And so functor F maps from C to D. It maps A to F A. G does something different. It maps it to G A, right? To a different object in D. Mm, those are both objects in D, right? Um, and uh, yet, and, and so similarly with B, right? So B is mapped to F B and... Mm, B is mapped via F, and, and B is mapped via G to GB. Hmm. Um, okay, so we have one functor mapping A and B to FA and FB, respectively, and another mapping um, and, and mapping uh, uh, another functor G mapping A and B to GA, GB, respectively. Fair enough. But remember, as, as Wade indicated, these functors further map morphisms. So, so if there's a morphism in C, the source category from A to B, we can lift it, right, with either functor. So we can lift it with F. Mm. We can lift it with F, and we do that by applying F to it, capital F, F. Okay, notation may be a bit confusing, but it's just like F mapping it, right? We, we lift it, so... So maybe F maps ints to list of ints, and, and, you know, B, so A is ints, and it maps it to list of ints. That's F-A. And B is doubles, and it maps it to, or maybe B is bools, let's say, and it maps it to list of bools, right? Maybe G is, is a different functor. It's, uh, you know, it's a, a maybe functor, um, and it maps ints, that's A, 
into maybe events, and B, that's bool, into maybe a bool, right? Great. But we can also map the morphism F. Um, so if let's suppose F is, you know, so again, it's mapping from int, that's A, to bool, that's B. So maybe the function is, is it negative, right? Is negative. Um, and it's true if it's negative and false otherwise. Um, so we can lift that function to operate on lists, lists, right? Remember F, capital F is, capital F is list. It's a list functor. And so we can lift it by F mapping it with the F map of the list functor. And so if we have a list of ints, that's FA, we can lift, this is negative to operate on lists, and we'll get a list of bools, each of whose element just describes whether the corresponding element of the list of ints is negative, hmm? right? That's F, capital F, F. We've lifted F is negative to operate on lists. Does that make sense? True or false? I'm trying to map is understand to or or does understand to to map it to people here. Do you do you appreciate what I'm saying here? Okay, I I heard a, a muted yes, uh, I think. Um, okay, good, thank you. Um, okay, and G, right, it, maybe. And so here we have G of A is maybe event, G of B is maybe a bool, and G of F is like, we apply to the maybe event, is it negative? We have a maybe event, and we get a maybe a bool out, right? If it's nothing, it's nothing. If it's, if it's maybe a, if it's just a, three or, 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 you know, uh, it, 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 it just carries the, uh, the value in there, uh, of three, um, uh, then, then it will be false. Otherwise, if it's, you know, minus three, you'll be true. Right. Um, okay. So we have this kind of square here because F of F goes from F A to F B and G F goes from G A to G B. Mm hmm. Um, okay, so, so we have these mappings of A and B and F between them over into D. And those uh, composed, you know, F A, F B, and F F, and G A, G B, and G F. Mm -hmm. but, but what we're interested in doing with a natural transformation is asking how do these two things relate to one another? How do these functors, how does the mapping performed by the functor, these two functors relate to one another? Uh, and we could imagine enumerating the way they relate to one another by characterizing a mapping or a linkage between them um, in D. So we have alpha A. Alpha A is a morphism in D, in D, from F A to G A. Okay, let's, let's restate that. So F A is where F mapped A to. G A is where G mapped A to. Well, F A is list event. GA is maybe event. And alpha A is a mapping between them. It's some particular morphism in D. So here will be a function in Hask that takes a list event and gives you a maybe event. <clears throat> maybe a function like safe head where if the list is empty, <clears throat> the maybe event is nothing. Um, and if the list is not empty, it just is 
maybe of, of that value. It's sum of that value, just of that value. You know, just three is the thing at the head of the list. Um, so it's safe head. Um, if the list is empty, it doesn't blow up. It just has the maybe is nothing. Um, it, it's, it's, so it's safe. And so alpha of A here is a mapping. It's a particular mapping. It's a particular function. But alpha is not just defined for A. It's defined for B as well. So consider B. Um, we want to relate how F mapped it, B, to how G mapped it, GB. And so we need an, another morphism here from FB to GB. Now, in, if we are dealing with Hask, that would be a, a morphism associated with, so it would go from like a, a list of bool to a, a maybe of, of bool, right? Um, and and it, it would map uh, from a list, uh, list of bools to a maybe a bool. And gosh, that could be safe head as well, right? Like, like it would, it would, if the list is empty, it'll be nothing. Um, if, if the list is not empty, it will take the first element and, and use that. And that's its maybe value. It's just that, that first element, right? Um, so uh, this natural, so alpha is what we call the natural transformation from F to G. It has many components. It has many specific mappings. For each value of C, this is where it gets a little bit confusing. For each object in C, every object in C has to be mapped to some object in D. No bones about it. And it has to be mapped over there. It can be collapsed, doesn't have to be mapped to a different object in D, but it has to be mapped. And each object in C, therefore, will be mapped to one thing by F, another thing, possibly the same, by D. And alpha relates them for each, for each object in C. It tells us how to connect where it mapped to by F to where it mapped to by G. So we have alpha sub A. That's because there's an A in C. Alpha sub B because there's a B in C. That, that sounds weird, doesn't it, in English? Um, um, and so on for each object in C. There's some mapping that says, this is how you go from how F maps it to how you map to, to where G maps it. This is kind of how you get from one to the other, how you translate from one to the other. This is how you, you kind of, um, you know, go from, from the, how, how F treated it to how G treated it, right? Um, but... Not surprisingly, okay, so you have this square here. You have F, capital F, lowercase f, capital, because you not only have the mapping the object, you have the mapping the functions. But we want this to be principled. We want this to be, to be, to be natural. We want it to, to kind of have a, a natural feel to it. And what, the, the naturality condition here is that, look, um, uh, we don't want this mapping with the alphas to be, you know, any old mapping. It, it does anything. Like, like let's suppose, um, well, let, let's consider safe head. I mean, we, we'd, we'd want safe head if we, if we've left it, uh, if we um, go and, and we, let's say, apply the function, so f, remember f from, say, int to bool, maybe that's is negative, right? If we apply that to a list of ints first, okay, so we have a, a list of ints, and we apply is negative to it uh, to get a list of bools, that's going from fa to fb, right? Um, we're lifting is negative to operate on lists, which is capital F. Then, and then we say, let's take the safe head of that. Let's, let's, let's take the, the first one. And you get out a value, right? You get out a, a specific value, which, which tells you basically whether the, the first element of that list of ends is, is negative. Um, 
Um, we want that to be the same as if, if you had just at first said, well, instead of dealing with this whole list, and, I mean, my God, we're, we're, we're doing this mapping down this entire list of is it negative just to get the first one. I mean, what, what, sort, of, what sort of wasteful thing is that? We're, our whole job is to get the first one out and we're mapping down the entire list. Maybe it's a billion things in the list and we're mapping them down, just taking the first. How wasteful is that in a non-lazy language? Um, and, um, and so why don't, it should be the same as if we just took the safe head of the first one. So we extract the first one, the int at the head of the list, and we get a maybe event, right? Because we don't want it to blow up if it's negative, if it's empty list. So we get a the first element out as a maybe. Mm. So we get maybe of three out. And then we could ask, okay, then we lift is negative to operate on maybes. And we ask, is this negative, this three? Nah. And so we, we get out a value. We want those to be the same. We want it to commute. We want, either way we go around the square, we want to give the same value. And you could construct in some wacko way, you know, a definition of safe head that um, if, if you used ad hoc polymorphism, it said, you know, if this is safe head of bull, you know, we return a random value or, you know, we always return true or something like that. And, and this wouldn't commute nicely. Um, but it, it kind of makes sense that either way we go round, it should give the same value. So here we're, we're dealing with this naturality condition. We don't just want this square to be any old square. We want, if we go around one way, we compose these arrows FF with alpha B, it should be the same as composing alpha A with GF, okay? Um, either way we go, to go from FA to GB, again, green arrow at the top, red arrow down, compared to red arrow down, green arrow at the bottom, we're going from FA to GB. We're going from list of ends to maybe a bulls, and we want it to give the same value. We want it... We want it to be natural. We want it to, to not get into the vagaries of, look, did we, did we do the mapping on, of F on, on, on the list first and then extract the first thing? And do we extract the first thing first and then do the mapping? I mean, we're mapping F. I mean, it should give the same thing, right? If we, if we apply it to the whole list and then extract, it should give the same thing if we extract the first thing and apply it just to that. It, it, it's the same function f. We're looking at the first thing in the end. It shouldn't matter the vagaries of how we do this, the, the ordering for it. Um, that's unnatural. If, if we had a, a, you know, a safe head that, that just always said true if it's a, if it's a, a list of doubles, or sorry, list of bools, but it, it, um, uh, it, it otherwise, oh, sorry, uh, the safe head that always returns uh, if it's a if it's a list of bools, it always yeah returns just um, a maybe of of of, of true, um, but for everything else, for a safe head of of, of a list of ends, it, it it gives the first element. That would be weird. It would be unnatural. It would be un, you know, uncouth. It would be unseemly. It would be inappropriate. It would be most unpleasant. Um, and it would be unnatural. So. And this is the naturality condition. If we can get from F of A to G of B, we want it to be the same either way. And in some sense, we've preserved the, um, the, the structure here uh, of we've stayed true to how F sees things and how G sees things uh, in this natural transformation. So that's one way to, to kind of see it. Um, Let's talk about another way to see it. Now, this is uh, this is actually from Miluski directly in this video, and I will be asking you to watch this video. Okay, um, this is another one inspired by Miluski's. Um, I rather like his way of thinking about uh, these things, and 
but I've taken the liberty of putting this on the board. But I actually used a bunch of colors, which you can't like like there's this green color which is for this arrow and this arrow from c which adds a lot to the actual diagram on my my screen up there um but uh you can't really pick up because the colors are too washed out by the photos so here again we have categories c and d but you know he envisions look um you have the original category and functor f maps it over kind of to the things on this plane this upper plane call it the F plane and G maps it to the stuff on the G plane down here down at the bottom um, and uh, and these natural transformations run between you know these different planes their morphisms in D um, associate each one for each object in C <laughs> that's what the subscript is um, and they relate where it was mapped by F to where it was mapped by by um, by G, and uh, what you can't pick up here, it's it's brought out better on the board. But basically, like like um, D and E were mapped to different objects up here at the top, but they're mapped to the same object down here on the bottom, and that's okay, that's fine. Uh, we just got to preserve this naturality condition, and you know here, uh, for example. If you go, look, you're, you're um, in F.A. here. We're always starting from F.A. and going to G.B. So if you're in um, uh, F.A. here, and uh, then we go via F.G. to F of C, the mapping of, of object C over here. Um, this is supposed to be green. So we go from this guy to this guy, and then we go... And, and so that's that's just lifting G um, to operate on F, say list. And then we go down to see where we would get to with G. If we had mapped it with G, um, we'll get to GC. Um, and we want that to be the same as if we started in FA. We're always starting at the same place. And we're going this other direction. We're going down immediately to where... To, to where FA is is mapped to, or sorry, where A is mapped to by G. We started at FA, and now we're going to GA, and then we 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 follow GG over because G goes from A to C here in C. Uh, if we lift it to operate on Gs, we go from GA to GC, and we want those to be the same morphism in the end. If we compose these things. We want it to be the same morphism in D. Just like here, we went this way, we went this way. So these, what this brings out, or is designed to bring out, it, it's not very successful given the poor resolution and so on, is, look, we can't collapse things. There's no problem collapsing. Naturality is not violated by collapsing at all. This lower plane could be much cruder resolution. As long as it's consistent resolution, um, you know, we could have collapsed GA and GB. Um, and in which case, this would become a naturality triangle, which turns out actually to, to feature prominently in category theory, particularly in cones. Um, and, um, and so we could have collapsed those. That would have been perfectly fine. Um, but um, we just have to collapse them in a way that's that's consistent. Um, so um, maybe G is the functor that, for example, takes the size of a data type, right? Um, so it always maps to the same object, int, right? It takes the size of a data type. Um, and you give it an int, it'll give you the size. Four, four bytes, eight bytes, or whatever. Um, you give it bool, give you one byte. Fittingly, I will take a single byte. And maybe, maybe it, so it, at G would then map any data type to an int, one object. So those two could be collapsed. Um, 
And, you know, here, um, if we are thinking about that sort of constant functor, um, that constant functor will be mapping functions as well. Um, and, and so it would, it would map uh, a function to go from uh, g of a to, to between g of a to, to g of b. So it would map, uh, the function would essentially map from the size of data type, um, the, the, the value for, for uh, data type uh, a and, and, and data type b. So, so g of f here um, would be a lifting of it to operate uh, on this this constant uh, constant functor, which turns out to be identity. Um, okay, so so this is a notion of uh, natural transformations um, that is useful to think of it as two different planes and kind of thinking the natural transformations as as extending down from the plane. Again, natural transformations are mappings between functors. They are labeled with indications of the objects to which each component of the natural transformation corresponds to an object in C, but the natural transformation is a morphism in D. Okay? Um, this is a third way to think about it that I rather like. Um, and I, I actually spent a fair bit of time thinking about how to have it, how to have a nice example based on maps uh, yesterday. Mm. I just didn't have the time after my undergrad course um, to pull it, pull it off. But, um, okay, so Bartosz Miluski, this is actually from the MIT course, um, shows this uh, a year ago now. Um, so he has some category F which has objects and morphisms in a rather stylized way. Um, and remember the notion of what he's appealing to here is the notion of functors as the way of finding a pattern in another category. So here, um, category C has this pattern. Remember that I gave you some examples, some exercises where you tried to find an arrow in another category, or you tried to find a single object in another category, or you tried to find a, two arrows in a row, or what have you, two morphisms in a row. Um, similar thing, thing here. So we have C being the category showing the pattern, D being the category in which we are finding the pattern. And the pattern here shows um, a, um, you know, a, a, a sort of uh, rather stylized thing which has, um, what, uh, six, six points. Um, and the morphisms are just these links between these, these objects. And he's trying to find this pattern in another category, D which has some more evocative, visually evocative <laughs> images of it, of a person. And in the bottom one is of a, of a dog, um, which has only dim resemblance to Doberman Pinscher, um, uh, but also could resemble a rabid jackrabbit, I suppose. Um, and um, here, um, functor F is mapping this pattern to this anthropomorphic image up the top. Functor G is finding this other pattern, this other instantiation of this pattern in the source. So both of them find these alternative instantiations of this pattern in C, but, and they find that in D. Remember, func these functors F and G both map from C to D. They're finding or they're mapping these things in C over into D. And what we're dealing with here is just a pattern we're finding in C, and, and F finds it in one place in D, G finds it in another. And, um, and that's fine. So for example, um, the head 
the head object here <laughs> goes to to some you know particular object here, which I guess would maybe the the point on the back of the cranium of the um, canine, the cranial uh, the canine cranium, um, and uh, the morphism here between the kind of head and torso is mapped um, onto a um, a morphism between that that point in the in the torso of the um, uh, of of uh, Brutus um, here uh, of the uh, of the canine um, of this dog here, um, but for a person it maps this object at the top onto the um, the, the rather e e large enlarged head object, um, uh, and and then it maps the neck morphism onto this neck um, here, and it maps the arm morphism onto the arm. Whereas on the uh, canine, it's it's uh, mapped to the uh, foreleg, uh, um, to the foreleg of the canine. Okay, um, the the uh, the dog's foreleg, um, and uh, remember that category D may have all sorts of detail that is not mapped to for C. There's no saying C for a functor. C doesn't have to be um, nearly as big as. D. In fact, it's very common it's not, right? And F and G do not have to be surjective. They don't have to cover all of D. So there could be lots of things here, and, and you'll see some some rather uh, visually evocative, you know, drooling on the part of the, the dog um, or the rabid um, uh, jackrabbit. Um, but... Um, uh, but basically, it's mapping these salient features. And a natural transformation here is basically telling us how we go from the mapping for the humanoid to the mapping for the dog. You know, like, what is the corresponding thing in the dog that corresponds to the human's head? What's the corresponding object? For the human's left forearm, what's the corresponding appendage in the canine, canine appendage, right? Um, it's that that left um, um, uh, uh, left leg, uh, or, sorry, the the left uh, foreleg uh, on the part of the canine, um, and uh, so it's kind of translating from where it is in a human to where the corresponding parts are in the dog, right? Um, and I think that's a very useful concept of the notion of natural transformation that gives it a certain intuition. Um, it's kind of saying, um, you know, how does uh, what the, these structures that we see to map by F correspond to structures corresponding to G? And when we're finding patterns, it's saying, how do the, the same elements of the pattern get mapped differently by each of these? The head of the human corresponds to what head in the dog? The, the, the forearm of the human corresponds to what foreleg in the dog? Um, the neck of the human, the, that's after all the, the morphism here, corresponds to what, what um, segment of the dog's anatomy? Um, and you map it over. Um, and, um, and that gives some sense of... Um, of natural transformations as kind of a mapping between alternative matchings of uh, of patterns, okay, um, um, and where we look at, at corresponding elements uh, of the patterns. Now, um, uh, with this, of course, there's some constraints, and and there's this constraint of um, the naturality square needs to hold. It can't be just any old mapping uh, from um, from F uh, from the things as mapped by F to the things as mapped by G. It's one that has to play nicely, that has to be sensible, that has to be consistent. Um, it has to be um, you know self um, self consistent and um, um, to to yield a a kind of unified picture, and and that's this whole idea that this diagram commutes. So he's shown this diagram 
in what's called the naturality square. Um, so this is this naturality square here. Um, any questions thus far on what I've covered before I go to one more? Um, oh, yeah. Um, uh, well, we'll 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 cover uh, cover that um, in a minute. Any any questions? What I've covered thus far about natural transformations before we go on to a more programming. We return to our our sort of programming um, notion here. Questions, comments. So remember natural transformations here as translating between different ways of embedding C and D. That kind of goes along with this picture. F embeds C inside of D in a certain way. And that embedding doesn't have to be perfect, right? It, it doesn't have to be injective. It, it, a splat a bunch of things together, etc. Um, and G has a different embedding of, of C and D, and the natural transformation translates between them. But it translates between them in a way that they, they play nicely together with this naturality condition. That it doesn't matter, you know, if you, if you first apply an operation um, in F's, kind of um, embedding and then go over to G's versus if you go to G's first and then apply the same operation in G, you should get the same thing. F and G may collapse things, that's fine, but um, uh, they have to collapse them in a way that 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 allows you to kind of fluently go, go between them in a way that um, the same operation is going to yield comparable results, um, you know, when applied in F, uh, F's embedding and G's embedding, um, and, and, and we start at F's and we go ultimately to G's, we, we want the results to be the same. So this is a structure-preserving mapping between F and G. It stays true to how F maps things and G's maps things while preserving the structure. Um, let me ask this. Do you think every natural transfer, do you think every pair of functors will have a natural transformation between them? I'll give you a hint. Alpha here is, is a morphism in D. The alphas are all morphisms in D. They're labeled with objects from A, but, you know, alpha sub A is, is how we translate how F treated A to how we to how G treated A, how F embedded A compared to G treated A. But alpha has to be a morphism in G and D, sorry. Um, does every pair of functors have a natural transformation between it? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, exactly correct. Maybe there's no morphisms between them. Maybe D is a category where A is connected to B, um, or F of A is connected to F of B, and G of A is connected to G of B, but there's no, you know, these are mapped to different solitudes within it, different connected components. Um, or maybe D is a discrete category, and there's no morphisms other than identity morphisms at all. Um, uh, it, it, we, we, we can't um, map map between the, the mappings. Um, if F maps every object onto one object in D and G maps every object to do a different object in G, we can't get from one to the other. So not every pair of functors has a natural transformation between it. Natural transformation is a beautiful thing. It's a very nice thing when it comes about. It says in some sense these functors are compatible. They play nicely together. They have a you know, they have a, a view of the world that's not the same, but 
it has a systematic translation, just as like there's a systematic translation between a person and a and a dog, ladies and gentlemen, and a dog. Um, so, um, but but not every mapping is guaranteed to to have that nice translation. Not every mapping has this nice way of translating you know, kind of a pattern up here for people to a pattern for the thing shown at the bottom. Um, so, um, so just bear that in mind. Natural transformations are nice. And if we have a square like this, commuting of a square is not guaranteed. I mean, after all, in, in general, if we, you know, if we uh, compose two morphisms, FF and alpha B, and alpha A, GF, um, and we don't have a natural trans... Well, let's just put it this way. I mean, composing... We can have a category, and there are many categories, um, where there are um, multiple different morphisms um, between... Um, you know, along different paths from A to C. Um, um, or A to D, you know, if A is up here and we have a D down here in the lower right, one goes through B, one goes through C, and there's no guaranteeing that they have to give the same morphism um, if you go each way around the square. When a square does commute, when it, it doesn't matter which way you go around it, that's beautiful. That's nice. That's... Um, you know, indicative of, of sort of a certain deep uh, compatibility. Now, this is what I'm saying at the general level. As we will see, for programming, we get naturality for free, uh, as long as we don't use ad hoc polymorphism to do weird things. Uh, as long as you don't, as long as you're using parametric polymorphism in Haskell, you're going to get naturality for free. It's called theorems for free, um, and um, but in general, it's a it's a strong condition. Any any questions before I go on to the final little programming example here? No. Okay. Um, Okay, this is an intuition, again, due to Milewski. Um, I'm, I'm indebted to Bartosz for his um, articulating some really nice intuitions for this. Um, and one of them that he says, look, when it comes to programming, if you think about it, functors are in a way like changing the contents without repackaging um he's talking here particularly about like when you do an f map with a functor their job is so suppose we do an f map on a list with a functor um so sorry the functor is 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 is, is list here and we do an f map of a function right what what does that do so um i'm gonna say here just to make this lifting with uh, functor lifting function with functor um, so if I you know have a list of ins and I apply and I map I lift is negative to apply to that list I get a list of bool right I've list I've lifted that function is negative which did apply to map ins to bools to now apply to now map list of ints to list of bools, right? Um, yeah, so if we lift a function with a functor, we change the contents without repackaging it. We It's still a list, it's just the contents are different. It's a, now it's a list of bools, not a list of events, right? Um, um, uh, but um, the same thing is true, you know, if you think of maybes, right? If we have a we have a maybe, um, and um, maybe it's a maybe event. We can lift with the maybe functor. We can lift 
is negative and and we'll go from the lifted lifting of that will go from maybe events to maybe a bulls um again we change the contents without repackaging it's still a maybe or in the first case it was still an end or still a list rather natural transformations are kind of orthogonal to that is what bartosz says and I, I i rather like this intuition look um um a uh, well well lifting a function with a functor is like we have a crate of apples and we go through and um you know peel all the apples right so all the apples are peeled now in this crate they're still in the crate um that's lifting a function with a functor. Natural transformation is like a polymorphic function that maps from one function to one functor to another functor. Remember, natural transformation, its job in life is to translate from one functor to another. It translates a functor F, you know, uh, characterized A, um, embedded A, to how functor G, embedded A. Um, and, uh, and, and that's rather different from lifting a, a, a function with a functor, right? It's, it's, um, here we're, we're mapping from one functor to another. Um, and maybe we're going, for example, from list to maybe with safe had, um, we're repackaging it without changing all the contents and and you know i'm gonna i'm gonna put here and i'm i'm refining you know bartosh's more um a more a brief way of saying it but here what you're doing is you're you're not changing all the contents you're repackaging it so maybe you know uh if we think about safe head where we're um extracting just the first element of the list if it exists and packaging it into a maybe, whatever that element is, maybe it's three. Um, if, if the first element of the, the list is three, we'll get out a, a just three, right? A, a three in our maybe. Um, we haven't changed the, the thing um, um, over. Um, we haven't modified the apple. Um, uh, we haven't substituted you know the apple with an orange for example whereas a functor um you know map uh, lifting a function maybe the function goes from um well, again from ints to, to bulls and we've we've changed it over the crate that had apples now has oranges um or now has bananas or, or what have you so we change the contents without repackaging it's still a crate but for each item that was there originally with a different type of item natural transformations it's like we are putting some of the items that were there originally into a different form so maybe we map a list to a tree um uh, for example uh with our natural transformation or going from one functor to another um uh using this this natural transformation um Okay, so um, if we're to put this together, maybe I should have uh, trotted this out earlier. Probably I should have. Um, okay, so uh, here F um, is the array functor, um, and uh, G is the maybe functor. Um, A is double, uh, B is bool, um, and um, we're going to have this safe head. Um, whose job in life it is to um, to extract the first element if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it's just nothing, right? Um, and um, alpha A here um, is just, since A is double, um, alpha A is something which maps from a list of A. That's this array. I should say list. Yeah, mumble. Um uh, to a maybe of a because g is maybe right um so it's it's its job there is to map from a, a list of doubles to a maybe of doubles because after all safe head extracts the first if possible otherwise nothing um 
And Alpha B, safe head is a list of bulls to a maybe a bull. Hmm? Um, to, to, to maybe a bull. So we're going from a list list of bulls to a maybe a bull. Um, and suppose F is, is, is negative here. The naturality condition here is a sensible one. I emphasized it earlier, but this diagram hopefully will make it um, you know, putting it all next to these, um, just make it explicit, we'll, we'll make it a bit clearer. So, safe head here, um, uh, uh, it, we, we have this naturality condition, and safe head is the, um, is the, uh, the naturality map picks here, FA to GA. Remember, the, the, nat the, the natural transformation, alpha, translates from um, how A is treated by F to how A is treated from G, or how A has been embedded by F to how uh, A has been embedded by G. Um, so we, could, we should be able to, to, to either go across FF, lift F, which is, is negative, um, to operate in lists. So we take all the elements of this list of double, maybe it's a billion long, and we... Lift is negative for it, and we classify each of those billion. Is it negative or not? Great. Um, may take a while in a non-lazy language, but it, it's straightforward. Uh, we can do that first, and then we can come down here. Remember, this is alpha B after FF, so we can we can then use alpha B to perform safe head, and uh, we're performing safe head here on bool because we've mapped already the list as to whether it's negative. So now we have safe head on bool going to maybe a bool, right? Um, and so we'll extract the head of that billion long list, which says whether or not the head, the very first element says, was that negative? We'll extract that and we'll get uh, maybe a bool. It says false because the, the head of the list was 3.0. Great. Or that should be the same as. It should be identical to first mapping over from the list to the maybe by doing a safe head on the list first. And this allows us to extract up front the head of that list. We're taking the safe head. And and now we have a maybe of just the head of it, and we can apply F is negative to that, to this maybe of, maybe of, of uh, double. And uh, we can get a maybe of bool. And the naturality condition says those have to be the same. Those should be the same. And it turns out that in Haskell, um, if you are using just parametric polymorphism you're not doing ad hoc polymorphism you're not special casing safe head for you know for how it operates on ints or on bools or on doubles and having some weird different rule there some unnatural rule for some things compared to others um these things should always be the same and as Bartosz notes in this particular example, this is actually very powerful because, particularly in a non-lazy language, um, you could use this to optimize it, right? If, if you know these two things have to, are the same, you could spare yourself doing processing of a billion minus one elements of the list um by instead of processing the entire list and then and then doing safe head on the result uh going through all that work of mapping them you can just do safe head on the list up front um get a maybe of double and then and then um uh do safe head excuse me do um is negative on that map is negative on that to get a, a maybe of, of, of bool. And that 
needs to give you the same results. And as long as you're adhering to, to um, parametric polymorphism, those are guaranteed to be the same. And um, this could allow for rearrangements of code um, to achieve this. And uh, Edward Komet's libraries um, uh, within uh, Haskell, I'm told, exploits these sort of equalities, these sort of um, structural invariants um, that you have, say, for a natural transformation to good effect. So if you're wondering, you know, like, why would you go through in Haskell declaring, like, SafeHead to be a natural transformation? Well, a key advantage is that it could allow a compiler to perform this, you know, cool transformation um, uh, of code, recognizing that while you've expressed it as, this one on the left, alpha B after uh, FF, you know, mapping over the list and then taking safe ed, it could realize, oh, wait, I could do that much better. I could do that much quicker by, um, by instead just doing the safe head first and then, um, and then mapping uh, is negative over that. Um, so that would be an example of why you might explicitly declare you know, SafeHead is a natural transformation. So, ladies and gentlemen, SafeHead here is a polymorphic function. Um, it is, in some sense, orthogonal to what we do with lifting functors. Um, um, you know, we are uh, here repackaging um, without changing contents. Uh, we're extracting just the very first one of it, um, of the list, for example, without changing its value, whereas lifting a function uh, such as FF is, is going through and changing each, uh, each element there. And um, uh, we are using that in a way which can um, bring to light certain optimizations. But this general rule of natural transformations as mappings between kind of comparable um, between different embeddings within uh, a given space and sometimes mapping between different instances of the same pattern found within a, another category is uh, are also very powerful ways to to look at this um and so I'm hoping when you watch Bartosh's um, a video on this, and possibly some others I will, I will recommend, you will recognize that while these natural transformations seem to be sometimes weirdly disembodied or, you know, it'd be these very abstract quantities, there's useful intuitions you could bring to bear. And I think it'll do well to reflect on these examples in light of what you see in those videos to give you a bit of a concrete grounding for what naturality really means in these cases. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there uh, for today. Any uh, closing comments or questions or um, things that trouble you about this material? I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm, I might be jumping the gun a little bit. But let's say we wanted to swap the order of list names and then a list of names. If we wanted to convert that to a name of list. Is there I feel like there Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that that's exactly right. Um, but I'm not. I'm, I'm kind of thinking. Okay, where? Where would I go from here? Isn't that just a morphism? Say you go from maybe of a list of int to a list of int to int, and then you use the morphisms, like return morphisms. Wouldn't that be? 
how you describe that. Well, yeah, so, so my thoughts are going on a couple of different fronts. So um, one of the things we'll be getting to is what are called algebraic data types. And with algebraic data types, you have these nice distributed law, distributive laws um, and, um, and laws governing um, their relationship with, with each other. And in fact, maybe and list, for example, can be expressed in this context of uh, algebraic data types, uh, particularly list is recursively defined, um, uh, maybe can, can be defined more easily. It's just it's actually like one plus the, the data type involved because it has a distinguished element. Um, um, so it's kind of a, 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 a value of of, of, of some singleton value that it can be other than the data type involved. And it turns out that when you have those algebraic data types, you get these really beautiful algebraic laws uh, that are that are not dissimilar to, you know, A times quantity B plus C is equal to A times B plus A times C. Um, and um, you get this ability to... to uh, to, to distribute over over these these elements there um you also will find this sort of um capacity to to combine um uh, combine components like that um at a at a more basic uh level and and some other related things in category theory uh involving involving types um so, for example, a function, a, uh, a, a function from an either uh, A or B to some data type, let's say, you know, bool, um, can be thought of as, as uh, a either of, uh, uh, of, of two, two functions uh, from that. But you actually need to specify both of them. If if you have, if you might have either ints or doubles, and you need to map it to a to a to a to a, to a let's say to a foo, um, you need both those functions specified. And it it turns out you need a pair of functions, and so um, you you end up. Um, seeing these interesting things where like either's get turned into pairs um or um or something that's uh on the outside uh can be swapped into the inside uh and and algebraic data types are very similar to what you're talking about and we'll be getting to them and, and they're actually quite delightful and it turns out with algebraic data types there's functors associated with them and there's natural transformations associated with them. And a lot of this stuff kind of uh, falls, uh, falls out nicely. Um, they, um, they can also be related with adjunctions in some nice ways. So um, yeah, it, 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 what you're saying is related to it. And um, there are these nice transformations, but I'm going to highlight that your question actually goes beyond natural transformations because with a natural transformation, um, you, you, you actually um, can have very different levels. F and G, when they map from C to D, might have very different levels of resolution on the things in C. One might collapse a lot and one might, you know, keep things quite high fidelity. Um, more embed C and D um, in a more more high high resolution way, um, and um, and so there's not necessarily an isomorphism between those at all. Um, um, there's there's another type of mapping, but it's not an isomorphism. It's kind of an approximation if there's a natural transformation. But then there are these beautiful things called natural isomorphisms, and that's what we'll see. For example, with adjunctions is natural isomorphisms, um, and uh, and natural isomorphisms come up in other contexts as well. 
and there, you know, it's really, it's really just different representations of different labelings of different mappings and preservations of category C and category D. And we can kind of fluently go between them without losing information. And a lot of these things where you say, you know, uh, you can make things commute, like uh, uh, a, a maybe of lists, um, can be a list of maybes, um, interchangeably, we're actually looking for an isomorphism. They have the same information. It's just we can phrase it in either way. And phrasing it in either way then, you know, can raise the opportunity for not only for theoretical results, which are quite nice, but for um, optimizations. Um, and, um, and you can do these transformations behind the scenes, which you know are safe because there are these guarantees um, that you have that it's a natural isomorphism. Um, and indeed, with, not, with algebraic data types, that's exactly what you get. You, you get these, you know, beautiful distrib distributive laws. It, it is the same thing. So you can be guaranteed to represent it like that. And that allows you to unpack it in ways that are advantageous for compiler optimization and machine mapping and, and simplification and elimination of terms, cancellation of terms and all sorts of good stuff like that. Cool. Um, okay. Well, um, uh, time is is marching on, and um, I see I have uh, another meeting come up here at twelve thirty. So I'm going to need to make myself scarce. Um, but um, if anyone wants to get going, you know, immediately on this, I would highlight this is the link right here. Um, I, I guess you can't see my screen, but um, I'll I'll show it one more time. This is the link um, for next time, but sorry, you, you don't want to necessarily land halfway through. This image was from that moment, but but uh, the, the link goes up to the, the question mark, uh, not included the question mark. Uh, so if you wanted to get started on that, you could. I will be sending it along with um, with slides and with these slides, and um, uh, I would suggest that you take a look at that. I may send along some links to additional videos that provide different perspective on natural transformations. And if you're feeling overloaded, if you're feeling, you know, that this is spiraling out of, um, of um, your level of comfort, just be aware, we're entering the third of the three legs of the stool. If you, if you can feel comfortable with categories, with functors and with natural transformations, you have earned your journeyman status. You, you've, you've got your ticket. Um, and, uh, you know, in cowboy westerns, they used to said, have gun, will travel. You know, you, you've, got, you've got your um, ability now to, um, to start grappling with, uh, with category theory at a decent level because those are the foundational canonical concepts. And we'll see lots of things that build on them beautifully, but these are like the biggest hurdles for, for students. The other stuff will be neat additions to that canon, nice additions to that central dogma, that central three triad. Um, and they'll bring out all sorts of opportunities. But this is, you know, the final challenge uh, at a foundational level to get your head around. And once you're there, you've gotten past a lot of the hump of category theory, like getting into at the very base, basic level. And we'll start to see neat things we can build on top. So if we go to add junctions, they're built on top of functors, natural transformations, and categories. When you go to profunctors, we'll deal with you know functors and and categories. Um, when we deal with uh, you know other types of optics, it'll be it'll be similar. When we deal with uh, matters involving um, 
you know, the modeling of producer and consumer things. So it's just, it's just this, this bunch of stuff. So this is what you need. And if you get past it, you'll be beyond the large, large, large majority of people out there who make a try at category theory. So um, if you can steal yourself and, and push on for uh, another little bit, this may be the most challenging of these three concepts, but um, we'll meet and discuss it. And hopefully these four um, points of reference that I gave today uh, the functional, you know, the functional programming one, natural transformations is sort of mapping between um, different instantiations of patterns, um, uh, these different embeddings in the basic naturality square. Um, that should uh, help you help you through it. And I'll look forward to getting together and, and giving this some good discussion time next time as well. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, I look forward very much to seeing you next week to continue to explore this. Thank you, and have a great day there. Thanks. Thanks. I'll be Thank posting you. the two videos. Take care.